Our ancestors did their best to explain things they didn't understand. Assigning mysticism and magic to things outside of their current knowledge, that's what we call folklore. Tales and legends to explain and warn people of things that may or may not be dangerous. Things we didn't yet comprehend. But nowadays, most of us shrug off folklore as bedtime stories and boogeyman. However, tonight I'm here to share with you allegedly true stories from real people who claim to have encountered terrors straight from folklore. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and I need you to leave a Spotify and Apple Podcasts rating on my shows, Unexplained Encounters, and Tales from the Break Room. Thank you. Enjoy these new stories, and be sure to send me your scary true stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. Lastly, go to eeriecast.com to check out our store and revamped website. Now, let's begin. Bigfoot came out of the woods. From Danielle B. This story takes place in Wisconsin, a few years after my first encounter in Oklahoma. I moved to northern Wisconsin with my husband when I was 22. That was about five years ago. My mother-in-law, we'll call her L, moved to Wisconsin a few months after us. She stayed with us for a couple of months and found housing through authorities. She had submitted an application, and a few weeks later, she moved in. Two years after that, my sister-in-law and her family also moved to Wisconsin. My mother-in-law was living in the house for four years. Then she was able to find housing in the town where my sister-in-law was living, which was 45 minutes from where I was living. The house was a small house, big enough for a single person or a couple. But it was better than living in an apartment. At the time, I was helping her move into her house. When we were getting the remainder of Elle's belongings, it was on a Friday, because I had Fridays and Saturdays off, so it was the only time I could help her. At that point, the only thing she had left were some pictures, bedding, clothes, and her 18-year-old cat, Prissy. Elle had left her car at her new house, and she was having trouble with it, so I had to take her back the weekend before that Friday. I got to Elle's place early, because she was excited to leave that place, and get settled into her new one. I think we all know that feeling. We got my car loaded up, and Elle went back to get Prissy. Elle said her goodbyes to her neighbors, then got into the car. Finally, we were on our way. Now, Elle and I got along really well, even though most people don't get along with their mothers-in-law. Elle and I usually get into trouble when we're together, but since we were stuck in a car, there wasn't a lot of trouble we could get into. At the moment, we were talking and laughing our heads off, remembering some of our funniest memories. Eventually, we made it to her house, unloaded the car, and Elle let Prissy out of the cat carrier to let her explore her new home. I was helping Elle move some of the heavy stuff, the kind of stuff that I could lift, but she couldn't due to her age. I took a look at the time due to how dark it was getting outside. It was 9 p.m. I told Elle, I gotta go home, it's getting late. She looked at the time and replied, Oh lord, I didn't realize how late it was. Drive safely home and watch out for deer. I replied, I will. I gave Elle a hug, said my goodbyes, and I promised to visit her next weekend. I walked out the door and got into the car, starting it. Before I pulled out of the driveway, I called my husband, let's call him M, to let him know that I was on my way home. After I hung up the phone, I pulled out of the driveway. The road from and to my house and Elle's house is a country road. There are woods on both sides of the road, or farmland. I was halfway home when I saw a doe crossing the road. I slowed down to a stop, because she was standing there just in the middle of the road. Also, I usually stop anyway, due to my history with deer. And usually, when there's one deer, there are more somewhere. She was just standing there staring at something behind her in the woods, which was on the passenger side of my car. I figured it was the other deer catching up to her. She stood there for a good five minutes, I'd say. When she finally took off to the left side of the road, 
I continued to wait, trying to be doubly sure whether there were more deer coming from the right side of the road or not. I sat there for a few seconds before continuing my drive home, but that's when I saw movement in the brush. I fully stopped again, waiting to see if deer were about to cross the road. But it wasn't deer that came out. What I saw was this creature which stepped out of the brush. It was on its rear legs, walking like a man. It stepped onto the road and right into my car's headlights. The figure I was looking at was about eight feet tall, with reddish brown hair. It seemed to have arms that came down a few inches above the knees. This creature stopped in the middle of the road where the doe had been standing. At that moment, it turned its head to look in my direction. That's when I got a good look at its face. I swear, that thing had a human face mixed with a chimp's or a monkey's face. Its eyes seemed to glow with some red in them. It stood there, staring at me, or at least at my car's headlights. This stare down felt like it lasted forever. I could feel this overwhelming fear in my body. Eventually, it turned its head forward and stepped off the road with one big step. Then, it was gone, disappearing into the woods. I just sat there, looking at where it disappeared. It was a good few minutes before I saw headlights in my rearview mirror. That's when I let off the brake and pressed on the gas. I was doing 60 for the rest of the way home. When I got back home, I turned off the car, just sitting there in the dark, trying to figure out what I'd just seen. I finally came to a conclusion. I believed in cryptids, Things like Bigfoot and Dogman. I believed what I saw that night was Bigfoot. I got out of my car, went into the house, and M was still up. He said to me, Hello, sweetie. Did you have fun today? That's when he noticed something was bothering me. He asked me what was wrong. I was hesitant to tell him exactly what happened. Unlike me... He believes there's logic that explains everything. Finally, I told him what I saw. He looked at me and replied, You, uh, probably saw a bear. I looked at him and said, Bears don't walk on their hind legs that long. Then I went into the bedroom, changed into my pajamas, and called Elle to let her know that I made it home okay, and I told her what I saw. She believed my story. Luckily, I haven't seen it since, but if or when I do, I'll catch it on my dash camera. You won't believe the things that lurk in the Irish wilds. From a Jason. This all happened over a decade ago when I was 12 years old, on a trip to visit my grandparents in a tiny village in County Mayo, Ireland, for the summer. I'll never forget that magical place. Their stone cottage was tucked away in lush, rolling green countryside. I was enthralled by the ancient forests, misty meadows, craggy hills that surrounded their house, so different from the city I grew up in. On the first day exploring the countryside trails around my grandparents' cottage, my gran emphasized that I should not wander too far into certain wooded areas. She warned me of the good folk that are said to still dwell there. I chuckled at the quaint superstition. Sure, I believed in leprechauns and fairies as a kid, but I was 12 years old now, darn it. I fancied myself too old for those childish fairy tales. A week into my stay, I met Sean, another visiting grandchild from the village. We were fast friends. We spent our days adventuring along the trails and streams together. One sunny afternoon, we decided to hunt for edible plants and mushrooms in a forested glen near the cottage. I thought nothing of it when we passed by a trail marked by an old cross-shaped signpost that Gran had specifically warned me to avoid. Pushing through the ferns into the shaded glen, we foraged for puffballs and wild strawberries. As we neared an ancient, twisted oak tree, Sean suddenly grabbed my arm and pointed, eyes wide. 
There, by the mossy roots, was a tiny, wizened man, barely two feet tall. He was dressed in ragged cloth pants and a shirt. He was digging furiously at the dirt with a miniature shovel. A long, white beard trailed down his front, and perched on his head was a bright, crimson cap. We ducked behind a tree, peering around the trunk at the incredible sight. Sean and I watched in awe from behind the oak tree, as this tiny man filled a sack with truffles he dug up around the roots, muttering in a strange language. I couldn't believe my eyes. Could this actually be one of the fairy folk my gran had warned me about? The little fellow seemed oblivious to our presence at first, but suddenly he paused his digging, sniffed the air, then whirled around to face our hiding spot, beady eyes glaring. I gasped at those ancient eyes that now bore into mine. The wizened face was weathered like an old tree stump, but shone with an unearthly vitality that I'd never seen before. He sniffed again, then his mouth split into an eerie grin, revealing a row of pointed teeth. The fairy man let out an otherworldly, high-pitched cackle that turned my blood to ice. Before we could react, he vanished instantly with a pop, leaving only a swirl of leaves where he'd been standing. Sean yelled in fright, and we both tumbled backwards. We then took off running for the trail. We tore through the woods in blind terror, branches whipping our faces. Finally, we burst, panting from the tree line, and sprinted up to my grandparents' cottage, collapsing on the porch. Between heaving breaths, I tried to describe the tiny digging man to my wide-eyed grandparents. At the mention of his red cap and white beard, my grandmother went pale as a ghost. She whispered something, Clericon, and made a protective sign over her heart. I learned that in Gaelic folklore, the Clericon is a fairy being related to the Leprechaun that acts as a sentry guarding buried wine and treasure troves, but he also plays drunken pranks on any trespassers in his territory. Gran was certain we'd stumbled upon a Clericon secret fairy path through the woods. I shakily recounted everything Sean and I had witnessed in the glen, the tiny digging man, his unearthly cackle, the way he'd vanished right into thin air. My grandmother listened gravely, continuing to clutch her rosary beads, making more and more protective signs over us. You're lucky he didn't lead you astray, or play a wicked trick on you both for trespassing on his realm, Gran said. She explained that the Clericon was a cunning, vengeful fairy, prone to mischief. We'd be wise to avoid the areas he guarded. Sean and I were stunned. Could mythical creatures like fairies and elves truly inhabit the woods near my grandparents' home? Gran's solemn demeanor convinced me she believed with utter certainty. She gave us ashwood charms and silver pins to wear for protection from fairy magic and tricks. I eyed the dark tree line apprehensively. Were those shadows shifting unnaturally? I couldn't tell. Over the next week, Sean and I obsessed over what we'd witnessed. We scoured library books on Irish folklore, discovering tales of fairies luring people under enchanted hills, trapping them forever in the fairy realm. Others spoke of fairy music entrancing mortals, helplessly luring them into bogs and rivers. Each story made the benign woods seem more ominous. By the following weekend, my curiosity overcame my sense of caution. Despite my grandmother's warnings, I convinced a reluctant Sean to venture back into the glen with me, just for a quick look. I just had to see if we could spot the diminutive fairy man again. This time I brought a camera, determined to document proof. As we approached the ancient oak, the air seemed to vibrate with a strange energy that made my skin prickle. Sean and I cautiously crept into the shadowed glen, leaves and twigs crunching under our feet. I had my camera ready, hopeful that we'd catch another glimpse of the fairy man. But the meadow was empty. 
With no digging Cluricon in sight, the only movement was the breeze gently swaying the trees surrounding the glen. I circled the gnarled oak tree, looking for any clues the little red-capped fairy had left behind. There were odd scrapes in the dirt around the base that almost seemed to form a pattern. When I peered closer at the bark, I noticed strange symbols etched into it. They looked like writing, but in no language I'd ever seen. The markings gave me an uneasy chill. We explored a bit further into the glen, cameras clicking at every rustle and movement. Yet, nothing unnatural revealed itself. Still, I couldn't shake the creepy feeling of being watched from the shadows. A heavy anticipation hung in the air, like the forest held its breath, waiting for us to leave. The sun was going down when we finally gave up our fairy stakeout. I didn't want to be anywhere near those woods after dark. We were almost back to the trail when a faint, sinister cackling arose from the glen behind us. The wind sounded as if it whispered, Away, away. Sean and I ran headlong through the deepening dusk, not stopping until my grandparents' cottage was in sight. I resolved then to take my grandmother's advice and avoid trespassing in those bewitched woods again. The good folk guarded their secrets closely. They didn't take kindly to meddling human children. Whatever magic dwelled there was not meant for mortal eyes like mine. Some mysteries were better left untouched, as I learned that long ago summer in Ireland. The remainder of that summer, I stuck close to my grandparents' cottage and the trusted trails around it. The tempting call of the verdant glen still tugged at me, but I resisted wandering back among the ancient oaks and unknown fairy paths. Some nights, though, I would gaze out my bedroom window into the darkened woods. On rare occasions, I'd spot odd floating lights among the trees, flitting to and fro. Were the evidence of the good folk going about their mystical nighttime deeds? It was a world tantalizingly close yet forbidden to mere mortals like myself. The night before I returned home, I glimpsed those strange floating lights once more. As I watched their hypnotic dance, I felt sure I detected faint laughter drifting on the wind. Despite myself, I whispered, Goodbye and thank you to the darkness. I like to think the answering breeze carried the words, Away, home with you. Now years have passed, but the memory of that long ago Irish summer remains crystal clear. As an adult, I can explain away our fairy encounter as vivid imagination or a glimpse of some ordinary forest creature. But the wide-eyed kid in me still believes magic truly resides in those ageless emerald woods. Though I have returned to that idyllic seaside village over the years, I never ventured near the old Oak Glen again. Some places hold secrets not meant for mortal meddling. The good folk keep their own counsel, only venturing forth when they wish to be seen. The Cluricon and his sly kinfolk likely still tend to their forest troves and weave their rings under the stars. That enchanted realm is theirs alone. I'll not trespass where I'm not welcome, lest the fairy folk lead me astray again. Something Stalked Me in Scotland From Danny Joe When I was 18 years old, I took a trip to Scotland with my girlfriend and two cousins. We were planning to backpack and camp throughout Cairngorms National Park. This was the largest forest in Scotland. In all reality, this was a present from my family, because they knew I always wanted to go and travel through such an old place. My girlfriend was nervous about going, as she wasn't sure what to expect from the wildlife there. I reassured her the largest animal in Scotland was a badger due to all the others being hunted into extinction by people. She seemed to be a bit more at ease, but she wasn't entirely comfortable. After almost eight hours on the plane, we landed and our trip had officially begun. After leaving baggage claim, we hailed a cab to get our way started to the forest. We made one stop in a town right outside the forest to buy some supplies. 
We stayed in the town of Pitlochry for one night before heading into the woods for seven days. While in that town, we went to a local pub for dinner and drinks. The drinking age was 18 in the UK. There, we asked the locals for some good places to hike to in the woods. We were having a good time when one of the locals started to act like something was wrong with us going camping out there. We asked the bartender what his deal might be. He responded that the guy's family had been killed some years ago by something in that forest, but he didn't believe the story. He explained to us how he personally believed the guy's family probably got lost due to the sheer size of the place and their inexperience. This made me curious to know more about what happened and what truly happened to the guy's family. I told my group I was heading to the restroom, but really I was going to go outside to talk to the guy who had just walked out the doors not too long ago. As I got outside, the man was leaning on the wall of the pub, smoking, looking like he was reliving some bad memories. I walked up to him, gave him my sympathies for his loss, but I was forward, asking him his story. The man looked down to the ground and said to me, It came from the darkness and took them from me. Instantly chilled, I continued to push, asking him, What came from the darkness? He explained he had not gotten a good look at it, but it was big, with claws like razors and deep red eyes. Out of my control, I sort of laughed. He looked at me with the most serious expression that I've ever seen on a person. He said, If you go into the woods and something happens, don't say you weren't warned. He then walked away. I made my way back into the pub to find my group, telling them what I'd learned. My girlfriend was enjoying herself, innocently dancing with some old man, while my cousins played darts. I decided then to wait till morning to tell them, to let them enjoy their night. We drank to the point my cousins started to puke, so we went back to our inn. After sleeping a little too much, we got a late start on our trip, but we were having fun, so it didn't matter. While driving to the car park by the trail, I told everyone about what I learned the night before. My cousins laughed, saying I imagined it because I was drunk, and my girlfriend looked mad. I asked what was wrong. She said, Why would you encourage the man who lost his family? I replied, Well, I was curious. When we started hiking, she didn't talk to me for almost two hours. I tried not to notice. I was taken aback by how beautiful everything was. We decided to make our first night's camp about 10 miles in. One of my cousins voluntold me to get firewood while they set up the tents. I didn't mind this. It gave me more time to take in the beauty of my surroundings. It was a quiet night that night. We roasted sausages over the fire. My girlfriend spoke up, asking me about the old man at the pub. I told them everything he had told me, that he believed his family had been attacked, taken by something in these woods. My older cousin asked what it was that took the family. I gave them the same details that I got. The next morning, everything seemed better. Everyone was joking, laughing, and having a good time. We hiked another 15 or more miles, stopping at a small creek to make camp for the rest of the trip. This time, my cousins gathered firewood while my girlfriend and I set up tents. We still had a little over an hour of daylight left, so we started walking around the area we were camping, just exploring, really. After ten minutes, my girlfriend suddenly screamed. In no time, my cousin and I came to her side to see what was wrong. She buried her head in my chest and cried. We asked what happened. She pointed at the ground near a small bush, there on the ground was a dead badger, ripped open, blood everywhere. I didn't put much thought into it, just maybe that it was a bigger badger that did it, maybe even a stray dog. I didn't want to touch it, just in case whatever had done it didn't come back to finish it. We walked back to camp and started to get settled for the night. Needless to say, my girlfriend was very on edge. As the night grew darker, we all soon noticed how incredibly quiet it got, like no sounds of nature at all. We tried to not think about it, 
and went to bed. The next morning, we ate breakfast and came up with a plan for the day. My older cousin wanted to go look at the dead badger again, but the rest of us wanted to go swimming in the creek and just hang out. So me, my girlfriend, and younger cousin did just that. We went swimming, while my older cousin went back to look at the dead badger. After a few hours of fun, my older cousin came back to camp, looking very confused. I spoke to him, asking what was wrong. He told me he couldn't find the badger. He said he went to the exact spot and the thing was gone. I tried to tell him if it was a bigger badger that did it, it probably came back for the rest. This didn't help his concern at all, and he told me he felt as if something was watching him, and that's why he came back. We didn't speak any more of it and finished the day swimming and having a good time. That night, while sitting around the campfire, my girlfriend admitted something. She said while she was having fun here, she felt as if someone had been watching us. I told her we were fine and just needed to enjoy the trip. We all went to bed and as I started to close my eyes, I could hear something walking around the camp. Something big. My heart pounded. I wanted to look out to see what it could be, but I was too scared to. Eventually, I forced myself to get up and look through a small opening in the tent. When I did, I froze. There it was, this dark figure in front of our fire pit. The fire was fading, so not much light was coming from it, but I noticed that it went from being on four legs to standing on two. I trembled. Even so, I wanted to see its face. Still not being able to move, I just waited. This thing walked into the darkness on two legs, then down on all fours. As it faded into the darkness of the forest, it turned around for a moment. I saw them then, the deepest, most red eyes. They felt unnatural, but it was real. I knew I wasn't dreaming. I didn't sleep at all the rest of the night. I knew if I tried to tell the group about what I saw, they would just panic. As the sun came up, I left my tent and I got a fire going. I gathered more wood from the area closest to camp. I didn't want to go too far. As everyone else began to wake up, I made some breakfast. My cousins asked why I was up so early, because I'm normally the last one up. I told them I was feeling energized and I wanted to treat them to a good start to the day. After breakfast, my elder cousin took me aside, asking what was really wrong. I confessed then. I saw it last night. He replied, What do you mean, it? I saw the thing that took the old man's family. My cousin instantly looked at me with the most dreadful look. Let's pack up and go. I don't want to stay anymore. My cousin basically yelled. Looking at the map we had, we concluded it would take the day and some of the night to make it back to the car park. We let the group know what was going on, and we agreed to pack up and leave. My girlfriend seemed the most scared, because she said she felt something watching her ever since we made camp. As we started to hike back, we all felt like we were being followed. My cousin picked up large sticks, because we didn't really have anything to protect ourselves with. After a few hours, it started to get dark again, but we didn't stop. We kept hiking. We needed to make it to the car park as fast as possible. I got my flashlight out, looking at the map. I saw we were only five miles from the car park. I was happy to see we were making good time. I urged everyone to keep going. As we started back on the trail, we heard a strange noise, almost like a growl, but more sinister. We all stopped and freaked out. I told them we had to keep moving, to keep the flashlights on too. We were moving faster then, but we could still hear those noises behind us. Whatever that thing was, it was stalking us, not coming into the light, but staying close enough for us to feel and hear it. I looked behind us just for a moment, and I saw those eyes again. I recommended that we start running because we didn't have much further to go. The thing was getting louder 
and closer. My girlfriend was crying then, but still running. I was the first to come over the next hill. I saw the lights of the car park. A feeling of relief and safety washed over me, but we still had a little over a mile to go. My cousin stopped for a moment as he was getting a cramp in his leg. None of us noticed, but when we looked back, it was just dark. We all turned and went towards him. He started yelling so we could locate him, but then he started to scream. I told my girlfriend and younger cousin to make it to the car park and I would keep going. They turned around, leaving to the car park. I continued on looking for my cousin. By the time I made my way to him, he was behind a tree balled up in fear. I helped him up and the two of us started to run. I could tell he was in pain, but I told him to push through it. We came back over the hill, almost to the car park, but we could hear that thing behind us moving faster now. It was like it was toying with us. I wasn't going to stop, I kept moving. But then I heard it growl again. This time it sounded angry. It felt as if it was getting closer and closer with every step. My cousin was then crying out in pain while I was close to hyperventilating from the constant running. Suddenly, it felt as if something had tripped us. The two of us fell. The car park was only about 60 yards away. We picked ourselves up and started to run again. We saw the lights from the rental car and it gave us a burst of adrenaline. As we ran faster and faster, I saw that my girlfriend had the doors open for us. As we made it into the light, the steps we heard behind us suddenly stopped. I helped my cousin into the back seat and I turned around. When I did, I saw those eyes again. I told everyone to look and they listened. That thing reached its hand out and scratched at the asphalt. The thing's claws were huge, cutting through the asphalt like it was sand. I got on the front seat and we drove away like an episode of Dukes of Hazard. It was still pitch black out, but we drove all the way back to town with the brights on. As we made it into town, we decided to keep going all the way to the airport. Our idea at the moment was to exchange our return tickets for an earlier departure. When we made it to the airport, we parked the car and ran inside. I went up to the front desk and I made our request. I looked down at my shoe, noticing that my pants and shoe had been shredded. We got to our gate and I told everyone I was sorry. I said on the next trip, we could just go to Florida. My cousins laughed, but my girlfriend started to cry. She said she didn't think she'd ever been that scared before. I told her not to worry about it, that we were safe now and we were going home. That seemed to calm her down a bit. I thought to myself, who would believe this story? This was 10 years ago, and I still have those shredded pants. I keep them as a reminder that we never know what might be stalking us through the dark. I give a ride to Lady Pele from Silver Bullet 54. In Hawaii, there is a volcano called Kilauea. There's also a spirit attached to it. They call her many things, like Lady of the Volcano, Princess, and the Volcano Spirit. A man I know named Hiro said the most common is Lady Pele. She was known to wear a red mumu and carry her walk with a little white dog. She's also said to be rude as heck to anyone who takes her rocks. They were her property, apparently. Hiro said the post office close by had just received five rocks the previous week from people who had horrible luck after taking them. They came with letters of apology, too. As we drove onto a road near the volcano, Hiro kept glancing around. When I asked why, he said, I'm just admiring the scenery. I knew he was telling a bald-faced lie, but I didn't argue. As we continued, heaven as my witness, both of us saw this young woman wearing a red muumuu with a white dog at her heels. We both looked at each other and bet we were thinking the same thing. I broke the silence by saying, Better pick her up. 
Bad luck is attached to her if you're impolite. I pulled over and asked if she would like a lift. She accepted, saying she wanted a trip to the visitor center. I let her take shotgun as Hiro climbed into the back. As I drove, we tried to make conversation, but her answers were only a word or two, often nothing at all. I figured that to be polite, I would stop asking so many questions. As we drew closer to the center, she told me to check out the shore because there were some beautiful shells there to collect. That comment reminded me of Namaka. Namaka is a sea goddess, older sister of Pele. Unlike Pele, however, these shells are considered a gift from her. I didn't ever ask her why Namaka was so kind while Pele was so selfish. If I asked that, I probably would have regretted it. When we made it to the center, she thanked me and got out. I bade her farewell and drove off. I looked back only a few seconds later, and the road was deserted. Hito and I were at the Kilauea Lodge the next day, when a young woman shouted, Lady of the Volcano! She both rushed over and saw Kilauea with an eruption cloud. As we watched, a cloud took the shape of the face of a young woman who smiled. A second later, it vanished into a mass of black and gray. I spit out my water, and Hiro just stared. I asked him, Did you just see that? He nodded, then whispered a prayer of thanks to her. When we took our seats, we were calm. After all, legend has it that Pele protects all who are polite from the lava flows. And in the end, the lodge ended up untouched. So, did I give a ride to Lady Pele? I guess so. Maybe I'll go back to Hawaii. Maybe even book a stay on the same island as before. I also have some seashells from the ocean. I haven't thanked Namaka yet. But if you ever go to the island where Kilauea is located, keep an eye out. If you see a woman with a little white dog wearing a red muumuu, you might want to give her a ride. What got into my room? From Anonymous. I live in New Zealand. I've been here since I was four years old. I don't really talk about my experiences with anyone because I know that most people will think I'm seeking attention. My story is not confined to one particular time or place. As a kid, I was always uneasy in the dark. Not of the dark itself, but more so of what could be in the dark. Because even as a kid, I knew that you won't really see something in the dark until it's right in front of you. Despite my unease with the dark, I've always been a bit of a night owl, staying up drawing or gaming. I always used to go to the bathroom before bed. Most nights, I'd go with no problem. I would turn on the light, walk down the hall, not a care in the world. However, every once in a while, there would be a few nights in a row where I could not bring myself to open my bedroom door. There was this overwhelming sense of dread whenever I would reach for the door handle. The weird part was, these experiences happened under the age of about 12, long before I'd ever heard of wendigos or crawlers or the rake. Whenever I reached for the handle, in my mind, I would see flashes of what could be on the other side of the door a crouched, pale, and gaunt humanoid figure with dark, sunken in pits for eyes. Eventually, these experiences stopped, but something worse began. I would wake up in the middle of the night, to my bed shaking back and forth. New Zealand is situated half on a fault line, so as I got older and more rational, I would think maybe it was an earthquake. But there were two factors against this idea, First, every earthquake strong enough to be felt in Auckland would be reported on the news. And second, the rocking was not random, nor did it have the build-up in intensity like a quake. Every time this happened, there were no earthquake reports and the rocking felt deliberate, like someone or something was at the foot of my bed moving it back and forth, though I never did have the courage to look. This experience has only happened about three times, each months apart. The next occurrence happened in the same house as the rocking bed. I got up to get ready for work. 
This was in the middle of winter, so when I was getting ready, it was still dark out. I was on my way down the hall to grab a jacket from the garage. As I finished doing up the buttons on my shirt, I looked up towards the garage doorway, and I saw it. A pale white head retreating just around the corner. A strange feeling washed over me, as if every fiber of my body was telling me, do not walk through that door. I just grabbed a jacket from my bathroom laundry and went to work. Events seemed to be quiet for a while after that, and we moved house about 20 minutes away. The last strange event was maybe a year ago in that house, and nothing has happened since. I was awakened to the sound of my bedroom door slamming shut. The following morning, I asked my parents if they came upstairs the previous night. Maybe they came into my room for some reason. But they didn't. The reason this one has confused me is that I sleep with my door closed. So who opened it? As I said before, nothing has happened since. But I do sometimes wonder what all this was. Does New Zealand have crawlers or Wendigo-like creatures that I don't know about? Teke Teke Stalked Me From Taro This happened around five years back, when I was working as an accountant at a major insurance firm in Osaka, Japan. Late nights unfortunately came with the territory, especially leading up to quarterly deadlines. I vividly remember staying past midnight one autumn night to finalize a big project before the next morning's presentation. By the time I packed up and left the towering office building, the streets outside were deserted. Throwing my suit jacket over one shoulder, I started my 15-minute walk back to my apartment. I decided to take a common shortcut home through a narrow alley that ran behind the train tracks. This would shave several minutes off my commute. Usually, I avoided the alley after dark. It was dimly lit and often had suspicious characters loitering about. But in my exhausted state, getting home quickly outweighed any potential risks in my mind. As I hurried into the ingress of the alley, the lights from the street behind me quickly faded, and I was enveloped in shadow. I suddenly heard a strange metallic scraping noise, echoing from up ahead in the dark passage. It sounded like someone dragging a metal pipe along the pavement. The hairs on my neck stood up as the grating sound got steadily closer, louder, as if approaching from the darkness. I stopped in my tracks, squinting to try and see the source of the noise. Should I turn back? I didn't want to look scared in case it was just a homeless person going through the trash. I hesitated, rooted in place as the shrieking scrape drew closer through the dark. The scraping metallic rasp was now echoing from behind me in the alley, surrounding me, my pulse began to race. This didn't seem like a normal homeless person going through garbage. The noise sounded unnatural, sending prickles of fear down my spine. I had to get out of there. Breaking into a panicked sprint, I ran headlong down the narrow passage, the strange shrieking sound giving chase from behind. In my blind terror, I imagined some nightmarish creature emerging from the dark, claws outstretched, I pushed myself to run faster as the harsh, grating sounds pursued me, closer, closer. Up ahead, I spotted a tall fence blocking the end of the alley. I scaled it frantically, not daring to look back. As I threw myself over the top and dropped down the other side, I heard the metal scraping stop right below me on the other side of the fence. Whatever had been chasing me let out this unearthly hiss of frustration as if angry it had lost its prey. Shaking violently, I turned and fled down the empty sidewalk. I didn't stop running until I reached the entrance of my apartment building several blocks away. I stumbled into the lobby, slamming the door, pressing against it to catch my breath. My legs almost buckled in relief at being safely inside. As my heartbeat slowed, I peered apprehensively through the glass door back in the direction of the alleyway. In the dim glow of the streetlights, 
I glimpsed a ghostly pale figure crawling slowly up the sidewalk toward the lobby entrance. I stumbled backward in shock at the sight, my breath catching in my throat. You see, I couldn't make sense of what I was looking at. This figure's spine seemed to be hideously exposed, and the lower half of its body was gone. I froze in terror, watching this pale creature drag itself closer to the lobby on its elbows. Its spine was exposed. I could even see what looked to be entrails trailing behind it. The thing's face was hidden by stringy black hair, but I could feel its sinister grin locking onto me. Realization washed over me in a cold wave. This was no injured human. I was staring at the notorious spirit, Teke Teke. It was known for attacking victims in alleys after dark. According to urban legends, it had been a young girl once, cut in half by a train, and now she sought vengeance by going after pedestrians at night. I'd always dismissed those stories as fictional, but here... The myth was distressingly real. The Teke Teke raised a long, talon-like claw and raked at the lobby door, letting out a bone-chilling cry. I jumped at the jarring screech, my heartbeat pounding in my ears. Slowly, the claw scratched again, the creature's nails leaving eerie trails along the glass as it mouthed silent words at me. I couldn't tear my gaze away from its nightmarish half-torso dragging closer. The spell suddenly broke, and I stumbled backward, whirling to run up the stairwell to my third-floor apartment. I had to get as far from that thing as possible. I could hear the faint scraping of claws trailing me all the way up the stairs. Only after slamming my apartment door and throwing the deadbolt did the noises cease. I pressed my back against the door struggling to control my panicked breathing, praying the Teke Teke hadn't followed me all the way up here. The image of its pale skin and bloody entrails was burned into my head. I knew I should look out the people to see if it was gone, but I was too shaken, too terrified to move from where I stood, barricaded inside. How could folklore have come to life right before my very eyes? I barely slept that night, ears straining for any sign of the Teke Teke scraping claws in the hallway just outside my apartment door, but the only sounds were the muffled noises of neighbors through the walls. Exhausted, eventually I drifted off to sleep, but only when the first light of dawn crept in through the windows. When I woke up, and I finally got the courage to peer through the peephole the next morning, the hallway was empty. Still, I couldn't shake the chilling image seared into my mind of that malevolent spirit staring me down. Had it just been a figment of my imagination, fueled by pure terror and darkness? Either way, I knew I'd never set foot in that alley again, especially after dark. In the following weeks, I became obsessed with researching everything I could about the mythology and stories surrounding Teke Teke. Most accounts described it as the vengeful ghost of a young schoolgirl who'd been severed in half by a train and now attacked victims by dragging itself through alleys on its elbows. But details conflicted, some disagreeing on her origins. None of my neighbors reported seeing any pale creatures or spirits, making me question if I had hallucinated the encounter after working so late that night. But the vividness of that memory unsettled me. I kept second-guessing every small noise, wondering if that yokai had trailed me home. However irrational that fear seemed in the daylight, it always returned after dark. Thankfully, I was soon able to change jobs, moving to a position with normal daytime hours. I made sure my new apartment was nowhere near that cursed alleyway or the train tracks, over time, I stopped obsessively searching Teke Teke folklore online, gradually convincing myself the encounter was nothing more than an overactive imagination, fueled by stress. But some flicker of doubt always lingers whenever I pass an alley at night. It's been over five years since my terrifying encounter, and I've never seen the Teke Teke since that night. 
However, I still get chills down my spine whenever I have to walk past any dark alleyway. That vivid memory of the Teke Teke's pale, mangled body dragging towards me causes me to quicken my pace until I'm safely past. Sometimes I find myself looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see it there behind me. To this day, I wonder if I really saw that vengeful yokai spirit that night. And I can't help but hope that it was all fake. But I know I'm wrong. Hunter Becoming the Forever Hunted From Silver Fang Lichen It's been a few years since this event. I still find myself glancing over my shoulder from time to time. I live in Utah, about an hour or two from Skinwalker Ranch. I'll also say that I was with my father and grandfather when this happened. The day started like any other. It was early morning and I had nothing better to do. I had just gotten my hunter's permit three months prior. I saw my dad was dressing up to go hunting for coyotes or rabbits, and he'd already set out pants, long socks, and the rest of my clothes to go with him, to trek the long distance and to protect me from biting insects. It took me about five minutes to get up and dressed before we spent the next 20 minutes getting his truck loaded up with rifles and ammo. That morning, once we got on the road, we headed to my grandparents' house to pick up my grandpa. Then we were on our way to their favorite hunting spot. It was about 45 minutes of a drive due to traffic from construction. We soon arrived at what we called Blood Hill. We began to unload our gear and packs. Understand the name they gave this hill is because you could run rabbits and coyotes up the side of it, slowing them down so you could unload picking them off one by one. We prepared our packs, went over safety instructions, letting each other know where we planned to be. That way we knew where to fire if we saw something. We ended up making quite the mess of some rabbits and coyotes out there. As we pushed our way back to the truck, we spotted movement at the top of the ridge of the hill. It looked like another coyote. As I pointed it out to my grandfather, with the two of us being quite competitive, we took aim at this coyote, getting ready to fire. When we did, we heard this blood-chilling cry, something like a mix between a coyote yelp and the scream of a man. Then we saw it. The creature we just shot stood up on two legs and was far bigger than some coyote. The creature had the mangy head of a coyote, skinny dark arms ending in claws, and splotches of fur on parts we could see. We did not stick around long. We all took off running back to the truck, hearing growls and thundering footsteps coming after us. Once we made it back, we all clambered into the truck, slamming the door shut in a panic. Just as my dad got his keys in the ignition, something slammed into the driver's side of the truck the sound of scraping bone or nail on metal filled the air. The creature was trying to get in, scraping at the windows too. Finally, the truck roared to life. We lurched forward, and my dad took off fast, throwing the beast off of us. As we drove like bats out of heck on the gravel road, I looked back out the window, and what I saw would stay with me to this day. It was keeping up, just inside the dust cloud we were kicking up, just then, we hit the tarmac. It felt like we were about to roll, but by some miracle, we didn't. And the monster behind us just stopped right at the end of the gravel road. As I watched the thing stand there, watching us drive away, the figure growing smaller in the distance as we drove, I felt safe, and we all swore not to talk about the encounter. Three months later, I learned about the Skinwalker, which got me hooked onto the paranormal and cryptids. The reason I said at the beginning I still watch over my shoulder was because I saw that thing again, outside our bedroom window in the middle of the night. It left only after my dog started to growl and bark, causing a racket. I work the graveyard shift these days, and I haven't seen it in a while, but I still get that feeling from time to time like something is watching. Thanks for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us in a number of other ways. 
you can go to eeriecast.store to buy some creepy t-shirts or coffee mugs. Go to eeriecast.com to listen to and follow this show and our other scary podcasts on your favorite podcasting app, or follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails for more screams and memes. Before I go, be sure to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.